So, um, hello and welcome to this joint talk by Halkavi and Kurdish Progress. We are happy to present this timely discussion to you all. Uh, this past year, the coronavirus pandemic has affected many communities, including ones from Kurdistan and Turkey. Today, we have a medical NHS doctor, a psychologist, teacher, and a community leader talking about the uh, curious areas um, our communities have been affected and crucially what can be done on a health, psychological, uh, education, and social basis. My name is Sultan Chakud. I'm a primary school teacher and co the co-chair of the Kurdish People's Democratic Assembly uh, in London. And I'll be chairing this discussion today. Um, I mean, I'd like to give just a very short brief uh, outline of my observations as a co-chair of, of a community center, of a very large community center, and also as a teacher. Um, I mean, the effects of the pandemic, particularly on women and the increase of domestic violence is what essentially is a pandemic within a pandemic. Um, and as reported, the reported cases have, of, of domestic violence have risen by over 20%. Um, but of course, these are just the reported cases. And um, the, effect of, uh, the effect of this over families and um, the trapped children within these abusive uh, settings are, um, are, of course, unimaginable. Um, as a teacher, I could say that there's definitely been a huge uh, impact on particularly deprived uh, families and deprived children from, uh, uh, from, from you know, on, on, you know, on deprived families and, uh, and children. And the gap in the learning has increased immensely. Um, Without further ado, I'd like to kind of go more into introducing our um, distinguished speakers. So Dr. Duygu uh, uh, Chetinkaya, uh, sorry, Jantekin, is a clinical psychologist, a psychotherapist. Uh, she received her master's and PhD degrees in clinical psychology from the Middle East Technical University in Turkey. And during 2015 and 16, she was based at the University of Oxford Center of Migration, Policy and Society, the COMPASS, as a postdoctoral researcher. Dougal Jantekin is a clinical psychology editorial advisor board member of Cambridge Scholars Publishing. She has given lectures in the psychology departments of various universities across Turkey. Since 2017, she provides psychotherapy services to adults, couples, and families at her private practice in London. She also conducts training, workshops, and research services for NGOs and community centers. Um, our second speaker, uh, Dr. Maryam Kaya, is a Kurdish GP working in East London. Her family migrated to the UK in 1992 uh, when she was eight years old. She grew up in Hackney. She had an interest in sciences from a young age. She graduated from Imperial College, London in 2008. Following training in general surgery, she entered GP training and completed her training in August 2019. As well as interested in human rights, she has an interest in health inequalities affecting migrant and BAME communities. Our third speaker is Oktay Shahbaz. Oktay Shahbaz is an educator, secondary school teacher, community organizer and union activist. Oktay has been a member of the largest teachers union in Europe, the NEU and NUT since he began teaching. He is uh, a part of uh, he's a part of a leadership of the union at a regional level and has represented the union uh, as an international solidarity officer, particularly around campaigns for right to education. 
Oktai has been uh, following the effects of COVID-19 on working class and Bain communities closely, providing regular updates to communities from Turkey and Kurdistan. Our final speaker is Israfil Erbil. Israfil Erbil uh, was born in 1972 in Marash Afrin. He moved to London with his family at the age of 15 in 1987 and started to work as a textile worker. He studied English for a year at Hackney College between 1989 and 90. Since 1990, he has been engaged in commercial activities with his family. Between 2009 and 2013, he was the president of England Alevi Cultural Centre and Gemevi. In 2013, he became the founding president of the British Alevi Federation. Now, the format of tonight will be presentations from our speakers and then time for question and answers at the end. So please post your questions in the Zoom chat and we will try our best to answer them. Without further ado, we'll kickstart kick with Duygu Chetinkaya. The floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. I'm, I want to share my screen uh, to show my presentation. Um, yeah, firstly, I will um, talk about the general picture for all communities, uh, then I will focus on uh, Turkish and Kurdish communities. Uh, COVID-19 pandemic led to a prolonged exposure to stress for all of us. And the pandemic has led to a series of losses from our sense of uh, safety to our financial security. The social distance and the security measures have affected the relationship among people. And the crisis has shattered our assumptions about safety and trust. Those with pre-existing mental health conditions have seen an increase in the severity of their symptoms, while others are struggling for the first time. Disease itself, uh, plus um, forced quarantine and lockdowns uh, have produced acute panic, anxiety, depression, obsessive uh, behaviors, paranoia, and post-traumatic stress symptoms in the long term. Moreover, uh, inaccurate information spread via different platforms of social media. This is called as infodemic, and this leads to intensified uh, panic, fearfulness, um, insomnia, and irritability. However, some segments of the population seem to be more exposed to the risk of these mental health problems. The pandemic is deepening pre-existing inequalities, exposing vulnerabilities in social, political, and economic systems. And this, is, uh, this in turn enhances the impacts of the pandemic. I'm going to mention uh, the psychological effects of COVID-19 on communities from Turkey and Kurdistan under three headings. The first one is loss and grief. Loss is a descriptive term for the crisis. Uh, people are confronting a wide range of losses, as I said earlier, including loss of health, um, loss of health, a loved one, uh, loss of employment and financial security as a result of economic upheaval, loss of social roles, uh, prospective plans, uh, certainty, sense of predictability, sense of control, sense of safety, loss of social connect connections and personal freedoms, loss of time and routines. The systems we depend on, such as work, healthcare, education, economic systems, all of them destabilize. So for all communities, it's a time of collective sor sorrow. So it's okay to feel grief over what we are losing. It's a natural and functional emotion. Uh, however, if someone dies of coronavirus, a number of things may be particularly hard for family and friends to deal with. An important psychological impact of the outbreak is that the families in Turkish and Kurdish community feel they couldn't uh, mourn the death of their loved ones because of the COVID restrictions. Many people have died or grieved alone. 
family members have not had an opportunity to spend time with someone who is dying or they couldn't say goodbye in person due to the infection controls. In many cases, the illness may have progressed and become serious very quickly. Sudden death of a significant person leads to feelings of distress and shock. The absence of or the impediment to performing uh, family farewell, farewell rituals deepens these feelings. Funeral rituals are important for communities from Turkey and Kurdistan, being with friends and family, sharing the suffering with them, accepting their condolences are important. The absence of funeral rituals is a traumatic ex experience for many families in the community because family members are prevented from fulfilling their last homage to the loved one who has suddenly died. And this results in feelings of um, uneasiness, anger, and resentment. These rituals help survivors to overcome their loss, decrease the risk of developing complicated grief. It may be difficult to accept the death of a loved one and the reality of a brain, and this can lead to post-traumatic stress symptoms. So talking and being with friends and family is one of the most helpful ways to cope after a close one dies. With ongoing restrictions and lockdowns, their usual support has been interrupted. If the health services become overstretched and family members uh, in uh, some cases may also have concerns about the care the person received before they died. And this in turn can lead to feelings of anger and guilt. Also, I can add another aspect under this loss heading, Turkish and Kurdish people living in the UK with the refugee status or asylum seeker status, uh, and also with an Ankara agreement visa or with a worker visa, they are facing uncertainties regarding um, their uh, income, job security and health. This situation provokes anxiety, stress and sadness for those with this respectively insecure status, and they feel helpless, frustrated and homesick. Older people are maybe the largest group that has been adversely affected by the COVID. Older people are staying at home to protect themselves from COVID, but it can lead to other uh, serious problems. For instance, they have uh, loss of mobility and balance, especially as a result of moving less. Also, they experience uh, cognitive decline as a result of lack of socializing and mental stimulation. They are more forgetful and confused. Uh, according to the HUK report, one in, in general, in one in three older people agree that their anxiety is now much worse than before the start of the pandemic. The news on television or social media or daily death rates always send the messages to them about their increased vulnerability to COVID, so they are very anxious about leaving the house. And there is no end yet in sight to the pandemic, so they can't have hope for the future. Even if they are vaccinated, they can't trust fully to it because of the speculative news about the vaccine, uh, particularly coming from Turkish channels, as well as the news about the ongoing mutations of the virus. They live with so much stress, uncertainty and isolation, leading to increased loneliness. They feel frightened, depressed and very much lonely. Actually, Turkish and Kurdish people form a close-knit community, but friends and family have needed to stay away because of a high risk on older people. Being separated from family and wider social networks is very difficult for them. Some of them feel down and they, some of uh, them have lost pleasure and purpose in their lives. Low mood uh, leads to self-neglect and lack of self-care in some people. They don't take care of their appearance, they don't eat, they don't go outside for a walk or clean their house. There are some services for older people conducted by voluntary and community sector organizations. These services are important because they lift the language barrier and because they can be culturally sensitive services. Uh, however, there are still obstacles like lack of digital uh, familiarity, 
Due to the lockdown and the necessity of social distancing measures, uh, all the services or activities like our panel have been moved to digital context, digital environment. So older people can find it hard to join or follow them uh, because they don't have or don't know how to use these applications. Another important group is women who have particularly been affected by the outbreak. Uh, we have been staying at home for our own safety, but for some women, home is not always a safe place, unfortunately. Uh, as Sultan said uh, in the beginning, uh, since the pandemic, gender-based violence, especially domestic violence, has increased all over the world. This is a crucial issue in the communities from Turkey and Kurdistan as well. The main uh, intensifying factors include isolation with abusers, crowded homes, uh, movement restrictions, reduced social support, security concerns, health concerns, and financial uh, concerns. Many of these women have been trapped at home with their abusers. Lockdown and movement restrictions further serve to isolate many women. Under these conditions, it's difficult for women to reach out uh, support networks as well as the services. I've been working as a counselor in a DV domestic violence project for Roj Women Association. Without private place, many women find it difficult to make a call or to seek uh, help online. Their perpetrators can control them easily because they are at home as well. Sometimes they can even intervene um, our therapy sessions. Uh, perpetrators also use the pandemic as a tool for abuse. So more complex um, other forms of uh, violence uh, may also develop and uh, they may further restrict access to services and psychosocial support. So abusers can also exploit the inability of women to call for help or escape. For those who do manage to reach out, domestic violence services, as well as social health, uh, police and judicial services are struggling to respond because they are overloaded and overwhelmed and less available. Some resources are diverted, diverted to deal with the pandemic. Women are waiting more to get a result. The support services are affected by, by lockdown. Domestic violence uh, shelters may be full, closed or repurposed. Another critical problem is here. The disruption of protective networks may uh, further increase violence and its consequences. When resources are strained and institutional capacity is limited, women face disproportionate impacts of violence with a wide range, a wide range of consequences. Migrant women also face particular barriers to getting critical services. Their abusers use their immigration status to control them or prevent them from seeking help. Some women fear um, approaching services due to the risk of uh, deportation or separation from their children. Women on supposal visas are ineligible for most government benefits. Also work means respite for many women. So the closure of non-essential businesses means that these women have, have got nowhere left to avoid violence during the day. Some of them hold insecure jobs in the informal sector. Many of them work in the family businesses like off licenses. So the money they take can be uh, also under their perpetrator's control. Heightened economic uh, insecurity makes it more difficult for them to live. These crises like pandemic increase existing inequalities, including those based on gender and economic status. Another secondary impact of the pandemic on uh, women is the increase of unpaid domestic labor. The lockdown and school closures mean that women face an increase in their unpaid labor because everyone is at home and has something to do. Children go to school at home, partners work online at home. So dom domestic duties uh, like childcare, 
the, all these responsibilities for disproportionate lone women. Uh, a report of the Institute for Fiscal Studies uh, says that mothers in the UK in general were one and a half times more likely than fathers to have either quit their job or lost it during the lockdown. All these indirect negative psychosocial factors of the pandemic have uh, consequences on women's mental health. They have higher levels of anxiety, depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. They also feel hopeless, helpless, and frustrated. Some of them have suicidal thoughts. They feel they are less able to cope with the abuse than they used to. They feel more afraid that the violence would get worse. So what should be done uh, in terms of the suggestions? The, uh, the increase of gender-based violence may not receive the attention needed in the context of the pandemic. COVID-19 response and recovery plans should include measures to address gender-based violence. The plans should be gender and age responsive and they should be multi-sectorial. Mental health and psychosocial support interventions should aim at improving the social and economic determinants of psychological problems. Because persistent inequalities, as I said earlier, lead to additional difficulties in the context of the pandemic. So a multi-sectorial approach and a, di a diverse support is needed uh, to address mental health issues. Voluntary and community sector organizations have carried out some projects to meet the psychosocial needs of the communities. Uh, today we have the representatives of two of these organizations, they know it more than me. More funds can be available uh, for grassroots initiatives so that they can conduct community-based interventions to address localized problems. Grassroots community efforts have been providing care, especially for those negatively affected by lockdown and isolation. However, people often don't know where or how to access this support. Information on available services and appropriate referral system uh, is required. So for better dealing with the psychosocial is issues of different um, strata of the society, uh, psychosocial crisis prevention and inter intervention models should be developed uh, by the government. And psychosocial preparedness by setting up mental uh, organizations specific for future pandemics is necessary. Rigorous research is needed to determine multiple risk factors of psychological problems for an in-depth understanding of the needs of the community and appropriate and effective service provision. This can provide the development of context-specific innovative mental health programs to support communities in the future. Um, thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Uh, a psychologist uh, Dugo um, Jantekin um, for this very um, in-depth um, knowledge that you've just shared with us. Um, I'd, before we go on to our next speaker, I'd like to uh, just mention that Philip uh, Granville, the mayor of Hackney, is on this call with us um, and we'd like to acknowledge him. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Israfil Erbil, um, the floor is yours, Isra Fairbill. Uh, we can't hear you. You have to unmute yourself. I think you're mute. Sorry, sorry, Sultan. Thank you very much. Um, hello, good evening, everyone. I'm joining you from uh, Brighton. I'm uh, uh, on a uh, route um, a trip uh, for uh, census awareness group. So we are going all around uh, through Britain. Uh, to visit our centers and make people aware of the census so they can uh, make themselves uh, uh, visible on the census forms. Uh, difficult times are passing, uh, but it's been really difficult for everyone. But for migrant communities like us, it was 
double difficult. It was triple difficult. So people really didn't um, know what to do. It was it was first time uh, something happened. So it was really a great uh, problem for everyone. But what happened was, uh, luckily, we were we were organized uh, even before the first lockdown was announced by the government. Uh, the Democratic Forces Union, Democratic Turkish Kurdish speaking and Alevi organizations come together and we made announcement that our community should stop wedding parties, our community sh should stop uh, and joining uh, funerals and, and, and similar uh, announcements made even before 23rd of March 2020. So as soon as 23rd March um, lockdown announced, uh, first lockdown, and then we organized uh, food banks, which was really important for people who whose uh, work didn't go ahead, who, who had no money, who was who was arrived in this country uh, recently because of Ankara agreements or because of um, recently um, uh, refugees, asylum seekers who didn't have any benefit rights in this country, who who had some limited cash uh, money on them. So they were only prepared uh, for a few months because they thought they will have a job in this country, but as soon as lockdowns were uh, 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 released and then they, they couldn't find any jobs, uh, so they were just stuck. So we had organized uh, these food banks. Um, it was British Alevi Federation headquarters in, in Great Cambridge Road. It was uh, uh, Daimer, uh, North London Turkish and Kurdish Community Center in Tottenham. It was Kurdish uh, Center in Haringey. So, and then lately we have organized our wood green Jemevi. So they were distributing uh, hot food, uh, vegetables, uh, uh, food, food packets. So it was it was something that we, we could have done in the first place. But be, these centers were not just working as food banks. These centers were, were also working as well-being centers, as, as, as giving people hopes. What we did, we um, distributed 6,500 registered packs uh, to families, food packets. It was done by volunteers, who was who was delivering them, and it was done by London cycling clubs who was riding to to homes, and and people come came and collected. Uh, so it was only from British Alibi Federation headquarters six thousand five hundred packets, but I am sure all the other centres have done similar uh, similar uh, quantity of uh, food packets. So we are still doing our. We are, our, our food banks are still running, but as I said, our centers are not just food banks. They are also uh, centers of hope, centers of help, uh, where people come and get help, uh, advisories, and, and you name it. So it, 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 was, it was really difficult times. Still, we are going through these difficult times, but we, are, we were lucky, we were organized, we had our organizations, we, they, come to, they come together, they organized a, a very good help and support to everyone, not, to, not just to our members only, but to everyone, whoever walked in the, 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 that door, they've got their helps. So, um, and lately our center is used as a COVID testing center. Uh, used by um, um, NHS and, and Enfield Council, and still our other organizations are doing any help they can. So um, thank you very much for, 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 for doing this um, conversation as well. So this gave me a, an opportunity to, to share it with you. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I like to thank the other speakers as well 
I'm sorry, I, I won't be able to see everyone else because as I said, we are traveling. Uh, but yeah, thank you very much. Uh, good night to everyone. Thank you, um, Isafir Elbil, uh, for joining us um, and for informing us of all these um, amazing, you know, all the amazing work that these community mm. centers, um, you know, organized um, at the from the beginning of the pandemic. That was a year ago. Um, you actually outlined it very well. Uh, you know, um, as a Kurdish community center too in Haringey, and obviously as Halkevi as well. Uh, we also tried our best to provide whatever we can to the uh, to migrant camps, to families, food packages. And alongside that, um, our Kurdish women's uh, charity, uh, Roj Woman, which I'll also put the details into the chat. Um, Definitely, have, yes, yes. We have, right. have actually carried out some amazing work. We have a Zoom therapy session with, uh, you know, with Dr. Duygu Çetin, uh, uh, Jan Tekin, um, every Tuesday at 10 a.m. to 12 noon. Um, I'll put all the details in the chat for anyone who would like to, um, you know, join those therapy sessions. And also we have a domestic violence helpline. Um, of course, these are all free of charge and connected to the Roche Woman um, Foundation. So um, thank you for all your input, um, Isafir Elbi. Thank you. Much appreciated. Thank you. Our Good next night, everyone. Thank yep. you. Thanks. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Maryam Kaya who is a GP and is working in East London. Um, and following training in general surgery, she entered GP training and completed her training in August, 2019. Um, I'd like to pass it on to Maryam uh, now. The floor is yours, Maryam. Thank you, Sultan. So um, as per the introduction, I'm a GP working in East London. Um, where I work um, at the practice, there's a large cohort of patients who are migrants, um, who um, are people who have limited use of English as a spoken language, and who would typically be described as belonging to a lower socioeconomic class. Um, since the pandemic, I've been working um, as a GP in clinics, and I've assessed both Kurdish and Turkish patients in relation to COVID, and non-COVID related um, and medical problems. And I've also observed the community's um, response to the pandemic. So I thought I would talk about my experiences since the pandemic and make some suggestions on what we could do to help fight coronavirus, because it is, it is still an ongoing problem. Um, and also to protect the communities as well. So in terms of numbers um, of people um, in the Kurdish and Turkish community who've been affected, um, with um, COVID. So um, I'm assuming the data collection will be um, retrospective because I couldn't find any reliable um, sources where th they were collected. Um, but let all of us know at least a handful of patients who, or, or people who, um, who were positive with uh, coronavirus. Majority of them were lucky enough to be treated at home because they had mild symptoms, but um, there were quite a few hospital admissions and um, people who might have needed intravenous medications. And there were also people who needed some oxygen support, whether that was by mask, CPAP or, or via ventilation. So a lot of them survived, but unfortunately there were um, some deaths as well. Um, a lot of people came back to baseline and um, some people did develop what we call long COVID. So COVID symptoms can last up to three months, um, but beyond three months, if people still feel, you know, if they don't feel like they're um, back to their baseline, their usual self, then we would categorize that as long COVID. Um, but um, but what, what I noticed, so I, I managed to get some uh, list, like uh, some patients who um, passed away in the Kurdish and Turkish community with COVID. And um, what, what, uh, what was interesting was that men were more likely to die. So um, in fact, like men were twice more likely to die of COVID than women. And this is actually seen in the UK studies as well, that men are more likely to die or the twice as more likely to die um, than women. With, from COVID um, and actually in our GP training, general practice training, um, as part of the curriculum, we also have a section on men's health and we're actually taught that um, men are less likely to seek medical help and they are more likely to die prematurely 
So I think this is something that we need to address um, in the future. In terms of access to health, um, most people are registered to GPs and I think we're lucky in the UK that a lot of people have easy access to medical care. Um, language can be a barrier for um, the older um, population more so, but uh, everyone has a right um, to ask for a translator. Um, and there was some frustration with patients because most of the GP consultations were done via um, telephone, um, you know, which makes sense because you know people always like that human touch when you see someone um, and you interact um, like face to face rather than just on the phone. Um, the response to the pandemic has been mixed, as I sort of mentioned. Like you know, it was a situation that none of us have been used to uh, or have you know uh, none of us have ever seen initially it wasn't taken seriously um because there were mixed messages from the media and politicians um i saw some comments like this is caused by capitalism um and there were angers you know towards the system and although there is truth to it that you know the you know the financial state that that we live in does cause health inequalities um and you know, it was one of the reasons why you know it was the poorer people and you know um, and you know BMA populations who were more likely to die. Um, you know, that is the reality, and I think you know we should be trying to challenge uh, these. But I think we also need to encourage social mobilization, and I think what we do in our different community centres uh, is great, and I think we need to do more. Um, and I'll go into that like a bit more later on. And as I said, uh, the community response to the COVID pandemic from the Kurdish and Turkish uh, communities have been you know, really sportive. Uh, community centres have had updates on um, coronavirus and um, there's been support to NHS hospitals and the staff through businesses as well as community centres. And more recently, there's been information dissemination about the vaccine, encouraging um, people to uh, take uptake the vaccine and there's been videos done in Turkish and Kurdish so there's been a lot of um, you know positives that have been done by the um, Kurdish and Turkish communities um, in terms of what we can do for the future I think our aim should be short term and long term in short term I think we should encourage people to see their GPS about COVID and non-COVID related problems. Um, like I don't want to talk a lot about mental health because Dugo has already um, spoken about that, but mental health is a big issue in the Kurdish and Turkish communities. And it's, and it's almost like people have accepted that it's normal to live with this constant worry and fear. And, and actually I was one of them. Like, you know, I, I was working and, you know, whilst I was studying medicine, um, I was constantly worried because it's something that I picked up from my family um, and it's very you know very commonly seen in migrant communities but it's not you know living in constant fear and worry is not a nice way to live and I think we need to get people um, to be aware that that is not a good way to live and you can seek help um, so I think we need to so we need to encourage people to see their GPs and also if they want any information about the vaccine or if they would like the vaccine, they can be uh, they can contact their GPs. Um, and actually so far in the uh, communities, like the Kurdish and Turkish communities, the vaccine uptake has been quite good. I haven't come across many people who haven't been keen. In fact, everyone's been asking me saying, you know, can you sort this out? Um, so like, you know, people are really keen to have the vaccine, luckily. Um, it's still important that we encourage people to maintain uh, social distancing and use masks because although we're, you know, we are getting immunity um, from the vaccines, um, it's going to take a while to achieve what we call herd immunity when a lot of people would be um, immune to it um, and less likely to spread it to others, but we still need to um, you know, encourage social distancing um, and mask use whilst we're still trying to figure out, you know, because we're, we're finding out if the vaccine is effective towards certain strains as well. So, yeah, so we need to encourage people to maintain social distancing. Um, and also, I think uh, we also need to think about whether um, 
we should be traveling internationally. So because a lot of the Kurdish and Turkish um, like members of the community, they like to travel to Turkey or Kurdistan in the summer. Um, and, you know, we need to think about whether this might be safe. Um, and, uh, you know, as well as following the government guidance, I think we also need to make decisions personally, um, depending on their risk. And also we need to have some sort of social responsibility about what sort of strains we might be spreading to the rest of the world, because you now unfortunately there is the UK strain, which we've already spread, um, which is slightly embarrassing in my opinion. Um, and uh, in the long term, I think we need to assess the safety of our events. Like I, I really miss the 1000 guest weddings uh, I think they're amazing and, and a lot of fun, but we need to think about whether it's actually safe to go ahead with them and when would be the best time to go ahead with that. Um, I mean, we need to aim to improve the general health of the communities. So encourage exercise, um, encourage healthy diets, uh, encourage people to have a healthy weight, encourage people to stop smoking, reduce the alcohol intake. And, and, if, and if it's an issue, have projects where we try to help people. Um, the, and also, as I mentioned, mental health awareness and treatments for this, I think um, communities should aim for funding. Um, there are loads of funding. There is a project that I am aware of, it's called the Latif Project. It's a project aimed for um, people of Muslim background and it's run by Muslim therapists and it's actually funded by National Lottery. Um, like recently I had a patient who'd lost her husband to COVID and she really wanted to speak to someone and but she, her, her English wasn't good. In fact, she spoke very limited English and she really wanted to speak to someone and she was also of Alevi faith. And I said, look, there's this charity that, um, and there was a Turkish speaking therapist that I knew of in this charity. I said, like, you know, it's aimed for Muslims. Would you be comfortable? And she's like, yes, like as long as there's anyone that I can speak to, um, I would like to speak to someone. So um, I think we need to aim for more of these sorts of projects. There are loads of funding that community centers could apply for. Um, there's Derman, which does amazing work, but um, it's only accessible to people who live in Hackney. So if there are more services that Derman provides uh, across London and the UK, I think that would be amazing. Um, Again, I think we need to um, target men's health um, a lot more, you know, make it okay for men to feel vulnerable and to ask for help. Um, and I think this pandemic has raised so many questions about not just health, but um, what health means. Like health is not just the absence of disease. It's the air that we breathe, the water that we drink, um, you know, our interactions with one another, our respect for one another, our respect for nature. Like there was um, some suggestion that global warming could have actually led to the virus, you know, from from you know arising and to actually helping it spread as well. Um, so I think as communities, we also need to look at how we. Um, you know, for example, when I go to some events, the use of plastic is ridiculous and there's no recycling. And I think we also need to take some responsibility as well. You know, we need to think about what cars we drive, um, how much we drive, like do we use public transport more? Um, like, you know, I've, I've recently paid to plant a tree um, because I realized that I've been using planes so much because I love traveling and to try and counteract that, I was like, well, I read that you know, I can um, pay for plantation of a tree, which will hopefully offset my carbon footprint in the world. Um, so I think we need to we need to just think about, you know, it's, it's all I think the pandemic has shown us that health and, you know, communities and the health of community is all multifactorial. And, you know, and, it, and it's not just communities. It's like, you know, this pandemic has affected the whole world. So we need to we need to look at it in a multi-dimensional way and try to make changes in every way um, possible um, and not just on an individual basis but also as communities um, as well so that's all i have to say for now but uh, thank you for organizing this event to all the organizers thank you very much for that Maryam. um it was very very informative and i love the move of planting a tree maybe you could share more about it with us later on and um, you know ways of how we can join this because it sounds great 
And I think it's something that everybody really needs to give back to nature, right? Because we've taken so much from it, actually. Um, it was very important, I think, uh, that when, especially when uh, Dr. Maryam Kaya mentioned the constant fear and anxiety um, that we as adults have built him during this whole pandemic. And of course, the impact of this is even greater on children. Um, and, you know, there's only so much we can really see, uh, you know, physically when we, when we work with children and when we, when we interact with them, there's so much that's going on inside that probably will unravel within time. Um, but of course, uh, specific strategies have to be used uh, in order to, um, or time maybe for that to all come out. So I'm going to now pass uh, it on to, uh, you know, uh, to Oktay Shafas, uh, who is an educator, a secondary school teacher um, that works very closely with unions, is an activist, as a community organizer. Um, the floor is yours, Oktay Shafas. Thank you, Sultan, and thank you to everyone who's organized the meeting tonight. I think it's quite, well, both timely and I think valuable that we, we have a platform like this where we are able to discuss uh, the impact of the pandemic on our community. And I think it's very important what Israfil said, and I think it's very important to kind of just underline how positive the Turkish and Kurdish community have responded to the pandemic in working together, in not just helping the people within their own communities, but also helping their neighbors, supporting their neighbors. You know, I was part of the work that was done by Daimer, which is a Turkish and Kurdish community organization. And, and, and together we, we, we visited hospitals, we've seen doctors, we've seen nurses, and we made sure that, you know, those people were, were, uh, were uh, definitely, definitely supported. And I think uh, one of the good things that this pandemic has done is actually to bring us together, to bring us as communities from lots of different backgrounds, ethnic groups together. And I think that's very important. I do feel that it's one of the key uh, items that we need to try and take forward in, in working together. Now, obviously as a teacher, uh, uh, you know, as, as someone from the field of education, uh, I have tonight been asked to talk about education and education probably been the, the most discussed topic this pandemic, uh, thanks to the number of U-turns uh, done by this government, which has, which has continuously let our kids down. You know, they've let the children of all, all, all ethnic groups and all backgrounds down with some of their irresponsible and, and some of their, uh, some of their uh, incapabilities uh, to, to, to say. But if there's one thing that this pandemic has actually exposed uh, was some of, the, some of the issues that we were having in our public services. I mean, Maidam talked about health, but I think we all, uh, we all knew uh, when this pandemic kicked off, that there was issues with our public services, from, from health to education, from housing to some of the welfare uh, issues. There were already issues uh, that, that, were, that was created by both this government and also by the previous coalition government. And, and I think let's not forget that. You know, I think, I think if our public services were in a better place, then I think we would, we would, we would be talking, talking about probably less deaths uh, and you know, both less deaths nationally, but also less deaths when it comes to uh, people who have lost their lives in the BAME uh, communities who, who make up the largest, uh, largest proportion of people who lost their lives during this pandemic. Now, it is very difficult for me as a teacher to, talk, to, to pinpoint to some of the key impacts using data on Turkish and Kurdish uh, young people, simply because Turkish and Kurdish people are not recognized in that sense in, in, in any of the national stats. I do know that some of the London boroughs are able to keep that data, but that data is, I'm afraid, not public. So it's very difficult to talk about it. But hopefully with the census that's coming, uh, you know, uh, I think it's probably the first time in the history of both the Kurdish people and people of Alevi faith where they will be able to actually identify themselves in a census. And hopefully next time we have one of these meetings, we can really pinpoint to the impact on, on, on numbers and on some of the data. Now, before, before I start talking about the impact of the pandemic on, on, uh, on education and, and Turkish and Kurdish young people, I think it's very important to kind of go back to the first lockdown, to the 20th of March. And at that point, look at where the education system in the UK was. And I think that's very crucial for us to understand uh, because 
if we don't understand some of that, then I, then I don't think we will, we will, I think we will find it harder to understand what's happening with schools today. And I know Sultan, you're a teacher, and I'm sure, I'm sure you've seen firsthand what happened to the education system over the 10 years. And I think one of the biggest things that this government has done since 2009, all the way up to 2020, was the, the, the cuts in terms of the school fundings. And we've seen, we've seen 9% cut uh, uh, to, uh, to spending per pupil in, in UK. And you know, uh, this, was, this was the largest cut in terms of education budget in, in the last 40 years of, of, of this country. And this was, this was actually after, after an increase of 60% on, on school spending in, in the 2000s, where we felt that, I think as educationists, as, as people who work in the school sector, where we felt that actually schools were getting, you know, uh, you know, becoming better places in narrowing the gap. But I think this government has actually made massive cuts to the education system, especially the spending per people. And at the moment, in terms of UK, England is actually where the, the lowest uh, money is spent per pupil. And I think that's, that's quite, quite interesting when we think about the makeup of the UK. Now, although the government has actually, uh, Boris Johnson has actually promised that he was going to spend 7.1 billion pounds on the education, he still doesn't, doesn't solve or, 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 or rec uh, you know, uh, cover the cracks of, of the cuts which took place for the, for the last 10 years. I mean, even, even if Boris Johnson uh, uh, pays that 7.1 billion pounds into the into the education system, he still actually leaves the schools six cents short of where they should be. I think, but but more importantly, and I think this is a very interesting stat, you know, 83% of the schools in England will have less money this year than they had in 2015. And the reason why I'm saying this, the reason why I'm saying this, when the pandemic started, the schools were already str struggling. Because of lack of funding, the schools were already making cuts to some of the key services. And we've seen services, especially for, for young people who, who are from different countries, who are new to the country. You know, departments like EAL are almost, almost completely disappeared from the school system now. And when we're talking about kids with special needs, when we're kids talking about kids with, kids with mental health issues and so on, we've seen that all of these cuts had a ma massive impact uh, on, 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 on these sort of children uh, you know, just before the pandemic started, you know, and in addition to this, we've also lost valuable resources, teaching assistants, you know, mentors, and so on. And, and then the pandemic kicked in, in March 20, and that was the day when it was announced that the schools, that schools were going to be shut. And I think one of the things that we, as, as, as educators and as people who work in schools, I think we were all worried about some of the children that we teach. And the reason why we worried about, why well, we were worried about some of the children that we teach is because we knew, I mean, in the areas that I work, I work in Haring Hackney as a secondary school teacher. And I know Sultan, you work in Haringey. You know, we have community members who, who live in, in, in Islington, in Enfield. And I think one of the first things that we, we were worried about was the level of poverty uh, 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 among the communities that we serve, but also within our community as well. I mean. It's almost shameful that in UK there's almost 15 million people who live who live in who live in poverty. But what's more embarrassing is 4.5 million of, of this uh, number is actually children themselves. And and again, uh, and to further add some in depth detail to that to make it relevant to the Turkish and Kurdish community, the BME communities are two to three times more likely to be living in poverty. So I am quite sure that within those 4.5 million. Uh, uh, people, uh, sorry, children. There are definitely Turkish and Kurdish children okay, who are who are uh, 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 who are struggling to, to 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 make a living. And I think when the lockdown first happened, we, we it was quite clear from the unions, from the teachers, from the school leaders that the government must actually act fast in ensuring that these ch these children have access to free school meal vouchers. These children have access to things like laptops internet and so on, so that they are not further behind with their education. But we had a government who failed to listen back then and who failed to act on uh, and, 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 and left it really late to start deploying laptops so that these children, including the Turkish and Kurdish children, can actually continue with their education. And it wasn't, it wasn't until a campaign done by a footballer, Marcus Rashford, that those kids 
those kids who were who were starving at home, who had failed to have a food uh, on their tables, uh, had food on their on their table. And it was it wasn't after that campaign that that the government started acting and 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 providing those free school meals. But again, it was it was at times too little, too late. But I think uh, we've, we've, we've seen more impacts of the pandemic. And I think one of the first things we saw last year in the summer of 2020 was the whole chaos around the exams. You know, and I think it's, it's important that we talk about that because, because uh, students of all ages have suffered, especially students from underachieving groups, such as the Turkish and Kurdish young people, the black Caribbean kids, the white students. These students have all suffered from, from the old exam fiasco. Uh, we were told last year that exams, exam results for GCSEs and A-levels should be determined by teachers. But instead of teachers, instead of, teach, instead of using the predictions that the teachers have made, the government tried to use an algorithm. Now, I teach computer science. So when it comes to algorithms, I can, I can give you a five hour lecture on algorithms. And I think what they did with this algorithm, so algorithm is basically an instruction. So, They've used an algorithm rather than teachers who knew these kids to determine what their GCSE results and what their A-level results should be. And when the A-level results were announced on the, on the 18th of August last year using this algorithm, and I think we can all still hear the chaos and the protest by those young people. And what the government did was they've actually, they've, rather than listening to the teachers, they've used this algorithm, which reduced the grades by 40% which reduced the grades by 40%. And, and, the reason why, and the reason why I'm saying this, and the reason why this is linked to the Turkish and Kurdish young people is because this was an algorithm which only applied to classes of eight or more students. So if you were lucky enough to be in a, in a private school with, with eight students or, or 10 with a smaller class, then this algorithm wouldn't have worked and you would have had your teacher's grades. But what the government did was use this algorithm in, in, in bigger classroom settings uh, and, and, and it basically looked at the results of the school from last year and it tried to model results similar uh, uh, last September, last August as well. And obviously lots of, lots of young people, lots of Turkish, Kurdish, you know, uh, young people and people from all different backgrounds suffered as a result of this and probably couldn't go to the university of their choices. And it wasn't until the U-turn, the government, that, you know, it wasn't until the protest by children, the parents and the teachers, the, you know, the government uh, made that, made that U-turn. And, 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 and obviously the government and its mishandling of education continues, you know, uh, and after the, uh, the exam fiasco, we were told that, we were told that the schools would be fully opening in September, 2020. And this was at the time where the virus rates was starting to go up, starting to go up, uh, uh, you know, uh, quite significantly. And we were we were at a stage in September where uh, uh, where 110 primary school uh, 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 per 100,000 students uh, were had coronavirus. And in terms of secondary school students, uh, we had 40 students, 40 students per 100,000 who had coronavirus. Now, the government wanted to open the schools, but the government didn't want to uh, introduce any, any uh, safety measures. And its guidance, again, Sultan, you will know this because you're a teacher, but its guidance on masks, its guidance on uh, uh, social distancing, its guidance on, on ventilation was not clear and was not uh, uh, you know, uh, clear enough for schools to follow and act on. And despite, despite the school saying that the, the, there should be more tests, there should be testing of students, there should be testing of, of teachers, they should be prioritized. None of this listened to, none of this was listened to. And it, it, uh, it led to a massive rise in terms of infections among young people. And I've, what I've done is I've actually got some stats uh, uh, from, the, from, the, from the London boroughs where there's a high proportion of Turkish and Kurdish young people. And, and I just want to kind of give you an idea of how much, how much the infection uh, uh, increased in those areas. So uh, let's start with primary schools. Now, uh, in, in, in Enfield, in Enfield uh, uh, the, the, school, the, the, the uh, figures for per 100,000 students increased to 470. And this was an increase of 251%. 
from where things were back in September. You know, and in Hackney, this figure rose to 394 per 100,000. And this was, again, an increase of 257%. In Haringey, it was 281 with an increase of 109% in terms of infection. And in Islington, it was 100% with number at 239 in terms of primary school. In secondary schools, the numbers were much more concerning uh, uh, because of their age and because of their interaction. So we saw in Enfield, for example, a rise of 113%. In Hackney, we saw a rise of 284%. In uh, Haringey, we saw an increase of 102%. And in Islington, we saw an increase of 84%. Now, these were all uh, result as a result of government's mishandling of, of the infection and, and looking after our children, looking after the Turkish and Kurdish children, looking after children from all of the other ethnic backgrounds uh, and, and the native backgrounds. And it was, again, the government's you know, mishandling of, 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 of uh, the whole, whole thing. And as we continued throughout this year, although the infection rates, uh, rates were rising, the government failed to act on advice of, of the scientists. So there was, there was continuous reminders for the government to do circuit breakers uh, so, that, so that the infections don't, don't, don't spread. But the government failed to, uh, failed to uh, act on this, putting in danger, not just teachers, but also putting in danger the lives of lots of families in, in every single community. Because, you know, although the children don't show those uh, clear symptoms, uh, I think in terms of the spread, I think it's fair to say that the children can play a massive part. And again, this advice was ignored by, by the government. And then also following, following the exam fiasco in 2020, uh, the government this year also insisted that the exams will take place. You know, uh, we had Gavin Williamson, the education uh, minister, talking in October, talking in, in December, saying that the GCSE exams will go ahead and the A-level exams will go ahead, the stats will go ahead, regardless of what happens. But, but and, and he, when he was asked about a plan B, he kept on saying that there was a plan B. Uh, and, and, uh, and what became quite evident on 4th of January, when it was announced that the schools will close again, uh, it was quite clear that he didn't have a plan B. Uh, but what that caused was, it caused great level of anxiety and great level of distress among young people who are preparing to take their exams. And I think from my own experience of working with the, with the Turkish and Kurdish community, I, I have never known a time where I had to make so many referrals to services like camps uh, within the Turkish and Kurdish community. I have never ever had to, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't remember a time where I, where I actually had to make referrals to, to, to camps and to other agencies of young people with, from the Turkish and Kurdish community uh, uh, for, for self-harming, for example. And, and it's fair to say that most of these things could have been prevented if the government, if the government had a, 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 a better, better approach. Now, the issues that I raised were, 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 were experienced by all communities, as I said you know, regardless of what your background. But as people from, from uh, migrant and refugee communities, uh, the Turkish and Kurdish community or other communities, we almost have like another layer of issue built on top of this. So we, 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 we have to experience that issues that experienced by everyone in the community, but because of our migrant status, because of our refugee status, because of our lack of English, you know, our, our lack of integration and, and so on, we also have another layer of, of issues to deal with. And, 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 and I want to kind of talk about some of those things based on what I saw within the community. You know, uh, we still have community members who don't understand the education system. So who doesn't know, who doesn't know uh, uh, how to be part of the whole system, who, 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 who basically sometimes are too worried to be, to be more active in their child's learning uh, because, of, because of their lack of English and lack of understanding of the education system. The language barrier uh, became a, a massive thing, especially with, with the remote, remote teaching. You know, uh, there was lots of parents that I dealt with, you know, both within the community, but also within my work, where they didn't know how to support their children. They didn't know what was right. They didn't know how many hours of education was, was sufficient. They were at the same time worried about their mental health, their well-being, but they didn't know how to address some of these issues. Uh, and, and, and also, and also uh, the community, because, because migrant communities 
have constantly been scapegoated by this government, uh, it, it was very difficult sometimes for them to come forward. And, and I think, I think Mayram kind of touched on this, but even kind of using services like health services, using services that the schools can provide, they felt, they felt almost too shy or too embarrassed or too scared or too anxious to come forward and say, you know what, can I get some help around this? And this was some of the issues. But I think going forward, it's very important that, that we tackle these issues, not just as a Turkish and Kurdish community, but as, as you know, by, by working with all of the other communities. I think the issues within the education system are experienced by all young people, regardless of their ethnicity, color, religion, and so on. So I think it's very important that we try to be, we try to use that community inheritance that we built during this pandemic to tackle some of this. You know, and I'm quite sure that uh, that there will be lots of campaigns and there will be lots of uh, organizations in the coming month where where parents will probably need to get involved to make sure that to make sure that the government the government provides some sort of a recovery uh, plan for the education system. So far, so far we've not heard anything from the government uh, uh, on on how they will deal with with the impact of the pandemic for young people. For example. The government recently announced uh, an extra 400 million pounds for school for extra tuition. Now, uh, and it, it also announced 300 million back in August. That comes to 700 million pounds. Uh, uh, but that is, that is less than uh, the 850 million pounds that this government has spent on the eat out and help out campaign. Uh, so they provided 400 million pounds thinking that is enough, but the 400 million pounds uh, is not enough to deal with, with the anxiety issues, with the depression issues, with the mental health issues. And I think this is where the government needs to do more. And as we are getting ready to go back to school next week on Monday, it's very important that we, we try to work with other communities, with trade unions, with political organizations, with community organizations such as Halkevit, Daimar, Alevi, Alevi Center, Cemervi, to, so that we support some of these demands. And I think one of the things that we need to try and work towards with other communities is to make sure that th there is safety in schools and colleges. We need to make sure that our schools are well ventilated. There's clear guidance on the use of masks and, and so on. And, and there's also clear guidance on, on social distancing. And, and, and we need to make sure that this government is, is dealing with the needs of uh, those students, especially with special education needs, but also uh, needs uh, such as EAL, you know, not being able to speak the language. And I think the government needs to go further in, in uh, potentially raising the funds for schools so that they can employ more, more teachers so they can have smaller classes, which are both safe and which will, which will help greatly in improving both the educational uh, uh, progress and the well-being of, of the children that, that we work with. But also it must leave it to schools on how they uh, you know, are going to work with their community to make things better for themselves rather than having a top-down approach. But what they can definitely start doing is, is they can ensure that every child in this country has access to technology and broadband so that they are never ever left behind with learning again. You know, there's about 1.78 million children in this country who do not have access to technology, who do not have a laptop, who do not have a broadband. And I think they are the things that that needs to be that needs to be uh, dealt with. And these are the things that we and all the other communities need to work together in campaigning for. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Oktay Shahbaz. Um, some really, really important points uh, you touched on there, especially on self-harming, uh, which is very, very worrying uh, amongst, um, you know, as you're a secondary school teacher amongst teenagers and also, um, you know, it's it's it sounds a lot to the when you say four hundred million pounds was put towards tuition. However, when that is broken down uh, in one of our school briefings, it was mentioned that it equated to only about eighty pounds per you know per child, which is absolutely nothing. You know, as a recovery program, um, you know, seen as we've been in this pandemic for a whole year, you know, what can eighty pounds really get for you? Is is the question? Um, some very valuable points, as I said. Um, and the use of algorithms to predict grades, which caused a huge anxiety, uh, you know, that caused a huge anxiety amongst uh, young people who couldn't, you know, um, 
you know, whose offers were not accepted into the colleges and universities that they initially wanted to attend because that obviously didn't reflect their real performances. And it's, it's very important to note that when those algorithms were used, the teacher's um, predictions and the teacher's relationship with the child in the class was totally thrown out the window and it was just yes, yes. completely, um, which really brings up the question of, you know, how much um, the, these edu uh, you know, the educators are being valued. Um, and obviously, the, the, you touched on very important points, such as the guidance on masks. Um, I think that's very delusional because, um, you know, you know, realistically, how how long can you wear a mask for within a classroom setting, especially when you have primary school children around you who will come and give want to give you a, a cuddle, want to give you a hug and, uh, you know, need that reassurance when they come to you. And you obviously essentially can't push them back and say, stay away from me because you do have those moments where, you know, you need to help them with their shoes and coats and you need to physically attend to them. Uh, so it was just, I think most of the things that they put in place for schools was just to tick boxes and say, look, this is what we're recommending for you. But these were all um, announced by people who'd never probably ever been in a classroom setting as an educator, as a teacher or a, as an observer, because it was not practical in a very small classroom where, for example, I personally don't have enough chairs to put out for 30 children where we're all cramped. And, you know, where, when does the ventilation come in? You know, there's so many issues around that, that. Um, I think schools did their very best to deal with, but again, it was just, I think, most like a list of tick boxes to say, well, this is what we've recommended. You know, assessing that and seeing the practicalities, is it going to work in real life was just disregarded. And um, yeah, that that made everything even, uh, even trickier and harder. Um, so thank you very much for that, uh, Oktai. Um, it was very informative. Um, I think there was a question, um, here about okay just going to see if i can um ah, somebody uh, belinda perryman asked does Maryam have more information on vaccine update amongst kurdish community in a small session with natim zahawi mp mid-january he expressed concerns about the vaccine update in the kurdish community um that question mm. So, I mean, naturally, being a Kurd from North Kurdistan, I'm more in touch with Kurds from North of Kurdistan. <laughs> and um, you know, Nadim Zahawi, I'm assuming he's been in touch with more um, South Kurdish population because that's where he originates from. But, um, like, according to my experience, everyone was eager to have the vaccine even before it was, you know, trialed um, properly. And everyone I've heard from um, has had the vaccine. And the ones that haven't had it can't wait to have it. The ones who have had the first dose are keen to get the second dose. Um, uh, but I'm not so sure about Kurds from the south of Kurdistan, and, and maybe it's something that you know needs to be looked into. And um, and I, I can speak. To, I'm actually thinking of speaking to some doctor friends who are from South Kurdistan and actually ask them if um, as much work has been done um, as we have done in the in the north kurdish um communities with with regards to encouraging um vaccine intake with you know following information of course not just you know encouraging them forcefully but just informing them about why it's so useful um to have it done but yeah so that's my experience of it thank you for that um All right. OK, so just the final thing I'd like to uh, mention that from the start of the pandemic, so that was last year, March, um, I could I, I think it's fair to say that we as the Kurdish Assembly uh, UK acted quite fast about the problems that may rise um, during the pandemic, especially knowing that, um, you know, uh, the, our community, Turkish and Kurdish speaking community, um, the you know our children, um, particularly in education, are one of the lowest attaining and showing the lowest progress. So we um, created a Kurdish Assembly UK Education uh, Instagram um, uh, page where um, myself and a few other Kurdish teachers were running. So we provided 
free education resources to parents so they if they got in touch with us via message or email we'd send them out packs according to what age group um you know that which classes their children um were in so all primary ages and secondary too um of course this um is open to everybody um from all backgrounds this is for all children so if you know of anyone who'd like more resources and more um uh essentially more resources, you know, to aid their child's learning during this um, pandemic. And, uh, you know, there is no doubt that um, many children have gone back in terms of showing progress. Um, you know, please don't do not hesitate to get in touch with us. So that's Kurdish Assembly UK Education on Instagram. Um, just wanted to check if there's any other questions. Um, So Zay Binbo has a question open to the floor. What has the impact of COVID been on careers and finances for minority communities such as Kurds? Um, I mean, I'm not sure if I'm the right person to comment, but um, I think because like, I think off licenses and like supermarkets have been fine. Um, I think, you know, businesses like cafes and um, in a restaurant they they probably suffered um that that would be my guess but i'm not sure if octai has more information well i wouldn't be able to give stats but i think one of the things that we saw in terms of careers is uh, is that lots of people in this country have lost their jobs during this pandemic and 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 the biggest losers of this were actually young people aged 25 and and under and i think in terms of careers and in terms of you know, job opportunities, it's fair to say that, you know, young people especially are, have suffered. Yeah. Not only, you know, new jobs, not only that new jobs have not been created, but also on top of that, within the current, you know, job market or within the current industries, because of the pandemic, because of the closures and so on, lots of people have lost their jobs and, you know, uh, and, and probably couldn't start their careers. I mean, I, I know this from some of the students that I taught uh, that, you know, some of them were, were basically ready to start a job in April. They had a contract, but, uh, but it all fell apart because of what happened with pandemic. And I think it's fair to say that that story kind of resonates around the country with lots of young people. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so I think we've come to the end of our uh, discussion. Um, so I'd like to thank everybody for joining um, and especially our distinguished speakers. Um, our events will continue, um, especially around the current issues regarding our community. Um, and yeah, thank you again to Duygu, uh, Jan Tekin, Mariam Kaya, um, Oktay Shahbaz and Israfil Erbil. Wishing you all a pleasant evening. Thank, thank you. you for coming. Thank you to everyone. Bye-bye.